Shannon Drake and Shannon Library cars began their journeys in downtown Pittsburgh, crossed the Monongahela on the Smithfield Bridge, dove into the South Hills Tunnel and started the long climb to the separate loops that terminated each line. Once upon a time, each of them joined different interurban lines at their respective endpoints. The Drake cars for Cannonsburg and Washington, the library cars for Charleroi and Donora. Both Pittsburgh and Johnstown systems were laid out for single-ended operation. Terminal loops were made in empty lots, sometimes around several buildings and even around the city block. Except in car barns, all the switches were moved electrically by motormen from within the car. On the single track, spring switches were used. Facing points were fixed by jamming scrap iron against the point. Cars of the 1600 and 1700 series used on the Drake and Library lines had different configuration from those that preceded them. The 1700s were manufactured with a steel pilot just beneath the front cowl. All windows were sealed except the rear. They had a roof-mounted, high-intensity headlight, special trucks, windows for standees, those are the horizontal slots above the regular windows, and a full roof ventilation monitor for forced air cooling. The exterior cowl on the roof ran almost the entire length of the car instead of just the last third. All seats in these cars faced forward. In earlier cars, Seats forward of the center doors were simple bench seats along the sides. Some of the 1600 and 1700 cars continued in use until after 1998. The 1600s were standard cars, but many of which were modified by the addition of the special features of the 1700s and assigned to interurban service after Pittsburgh had received them. The building on the left was a car barn, and later an administration building. An interlocking plant on the second floor controlled the switches of some six different lines, which converged here. In later years, the trolleys controlled their own destiny by means of overhead contact switches operated by the trolley shoe itself. In many places, two trolley wires were used side by side, about six inches apart, on single track. This did away with the need for wire frogs on the numerous passing tracks.
Dawn Junction, cars from the Shannon, Dormont, Mount Lebanon, and Bel Air lines came together to cross a deep ravine on the Palm Garden Trestle. The trestle was named after a well-known dance hall of the 1890s, located at the north end of the trestle. ECC, or President's Conference Car, figures prominently in this and many of our traction tapes. Every trolley fan knows by heart the story of the PCC, but for newcomers, here's a brief outline of its origin and the reasons for its astonishingly wide acceptance. In the 30s, every trolley line nationwide was desperately seeking a way to stem the decline in ridership. Wide acceptance of the automobile was a factor, but beyond that, there was a dismal record of passenger appeal. What was needed to bring back the passenger was modern styling, absence of noise, smoothness, and operating characteristics much better than were, at the beginning of design, deemed possible. The final results were such a pronounced departure from the ordinary streetcars that, except for the fact that the new vehicle got power from an overhead wire and ran on tracks, it bore no resemblance whatsoever to any predecessor. The St. Louis Car Company was chosen to make this dream come true. Brooklyn placed the first order for 100 cars. Pittsburgh was close behind with another 100. The St. Louis Car Company had a long history of developing new types of trolley cars. In 1902, it built the first private cars for railway executives. In 1912, it built the first interurban sleeping cars. In cooperation with General Motors, it built the first gas electric rail car. They even assembled one of the first diesel electric engines for the Santa Fe Super Chief. When introduced in 1936, the acceleration rate of the PCC 
was more than double that of the conventional streetcar, even faster than the average automobile of the time. On level track, the PCC was designed to make 42 miles an hour. Top speed was 50. Particularly smooth acceleration was achieved by greatly increasing the resistance points in the control and by using a continuous rheostat instead of series parallel resistance points. To stop the car quickly without skidding or jerking, three types of brakes were used. Dynamic, magnetic, and air. The dynamic brake actuated first. After the brake pedal was depressed more than three inches, the magnetic brake kicked in. These two brought the car to a halt. After the dynamic brake defeated, the air brake took over and held the car. The quietness of the PCC was another source of astonishment. This was achieved in part by the extensive use of rubber massive rubber springs and a special floating bolster received the kingpins of the car body. Other rubber, rubber springs, shock absorbers, rubber cushioned wheels prevented any metal to metal path between the rails and the body of the car. More than 400 pounds of rubber were used in each one.
was the only Y on the system. century, it was possible to make long journeys by connecting from one interurban line to another. One could go all the way, from New York to Chicago, for instance, even on at Iowa and Nebraska. It was slower than finding a railway line and going from one large downtown terminal to another. But at the turn of the century, America was a country of small towns, generally farming communities. They came complete with strong social ties and a homogenous sense of civic pride. Few people ever locked their doors. More often than not, trolley lines stretched from each to the four points of the compass. in Pittsburgh in the 50s and 60s. And even today, every route turns around in Pittsburgh and heads back to where it came from. This lends itself to a fast fare collection system. Passengers pay on entering inbound cars and pay when leaving outbound cars. This eliminates the dozens of fare collectors downtown during rush hours.
Incredible fine view. The route was called so steep it actually replaced an incline. It began in 1908 on the north bank of the Allegheny and did not originate in the city of Pittsburgh itself until the first PC series had been received in 1952. All service north of the river ended in 1966, including, of course, Fineview. Buses were planned for Fineview, but after trolley service ended, it was found that the grades were too steep, the trolley right away too narrow, and its curvature too severe to accommodate buses. As a result, Fineview was isolated without access to public transportation. In its 58 years of operation, Fineview was the standard by which the most spectacular trolley car lines throughout the world were judged. Along Henderson Street, the grade exceeded 12%. At Katona Street, it rose to 12.24%, which was said to be the steepest non-rack railroad grade anywhere in the world. From Pittsburgh to the highest point on the Fineview line, the trolley car would climb 455 feet. Consider that a round trip over the entire line, including interim descents before reaching the final summit, could be made in 40 minutes. Route 10 continued from the Keating Car House through Westview to the amusement park. Here, they changed roll signs to Route 15, Bellevue, and continued on in a giant loop back downtown. Much of Pittsburgh's trolley system ran on its own private right away. Much of this, in turn, was unpaved. In the Fineview area, however, tracks ran on pavement not much wider than the single track trolley line itself. And in Pittsburgh, the tracks were a generous five feet two inches apart. Since the trolley lines were the only paved areas in much of Fineview, some Fineview motorists couldn't resist the opportunity to save time and have a far more comfortable trip by seizing command of the trolley right away with their automobiles, particularly after a, a, a <clears throat> late after evening party, where the route was obscured by dense undergrowth at trackside. This caper didn't require as much courage as those places where the sides of the trolleys seemed to brush the very front steps of the row houses. Washington line runs atop the cliffs above the Monongahela River. It has grades of 10.89 and 11.27. In September 1966, severe cutbacks on the South Hill trolley lines began. The Brook Line and Mount Washington lines were replaced by buses.
After 1958, the Ardmore Line, Route 87, became the longest trolley ride in Pittsburgh, 14 and a half miles from downtown to Wilmerding. A round trip required two and a half hours. The maximum grade was 9.6%. In September 1966, on the east end of the Ardmore Line, it was cut back from Wilmerding to Wilkinsburg without replacement by buses. All east end routes became weekday only. Nine other routes became bus operated by the following spring. lines were painted in a wide white stripe. In this picture you see one bulging to the right of the picture itself. To create them, paint spray guns were mounted on the four corners of a special work car. The sprays were activated as the car slowly rounded a corner. Some curves were so sharp and their overhangs so great that in some cases you see the danger line crossing both curb and parts of the sidewalk. In some narrow streets, the trolley rails came close enough to the curb that passengers could step directly aboard the car. In others, rails actually severed the curb and continued onto the sidewalk. In many places, cars must actually park with their right-hand wheels on the sidewalk. In 1961, with more than 40 lines, Pittsburgh's transit system was the largest in America. Long after the other major trolley systems in the United States had been torn apart for scrap and melted down, Pittsburgh trolleys continued to flourish, and for more than 10 years <coughs> after most of their peers had vanished, Pittsburgh still pursued its own unique vision of how transit operations ought to work, embellishing them, sometimes flamboyantly, with fresh ideas and brilliant colors.
Thank you.